Good evening, Council. As you are no doubt aware, today marks the official release date of the visual novel Shadows of New York, a standalone expansion sort of sequel to last year's Coteries of New York, which I played on my channel back in December. I was given the opportunity to play and review this upcoming game, hence why I'm making this video, but I wanted to make something even more special out of this, so this video will be divided into three parts. In the first part, I will be discussing some of New York's recent history in order to fill you in on events that have helped shape the modern knights. I will briefly discuss the war between the Sabbat and the Camarilla over the territory, as well as some of the key players who are still around from that time. After that, I will give a brief plot summary of Coteries of New York in case you haven't played that game. It will not be a point-by-point -point breakdown of everything that happened, but I do feel that it is important to know some things about the previous title, because while it is not crucial to have played Coteries, going into Shadows without knowing what happened in its predecessor will make it a bit of a lesser experience. This part of course will be very spoiler heavy for Coteries of New York, and if you haven't played that game, be aware that it might lessen your experience. That being said, even if you have played Coteries of New York, due to its structure, some of the facts I will present may not have been revealed during your playthrough, and in fact, I didn't realize a lot of this stuff before I did some reading up on it. In my third and final part, I will give an overview of Shadows of New York, a rundown on how it differs from the previous title, as well as my personal opinion of the game. This will be more of your typical review of a game, and should not contain that much in terms of spoilers. There will be a timestamp appearing on the screen right now, as well as in the description, if you want to skip ahead to any of these three parts. A fair word of warning though, even though I don't want to spoil some of the key events in Shadows of New York, if you want to go into the game completely blind, there will be some things in this video that will spoil that experience, even if you don't watch the last part. Primarily in the background of the video, as I will be using footage from it. You have been warned, and will be warned again when we're going into obvious spoiler territory. I do strongly recommend that you play the game Shadows of New York if you can, however. It is an excellent title, and I can already say that I think it trumps Coteries of New York in more or less every way. When what would come to be New York was first settled by Europeans, it would be settled by the Dutch. And while they never had much interest in the lands beyond the profit they could make from trading, a select group of kindred from the old country invested themselves in these affairs, seeing in them an opportunity to provide transports or banishment to local vampires who needed to come away from the political hot pot of Europe. In the 1660s, England claimed the New Amsterdam colony from the Dutch, eventually naming it New York, and presumably somewhere around that time a certain Katharina of the Bruja, famous anarch turned Sabbat, rose to prominence as the bishop of this burgeoning city. Ekaterina had famously worked tirelessly hundreds of years ago to try to recreate the splendors of Carthage in Prague along with her Prometheans, although she later joined forces with the nascent Sabbat. The Camarilla and Mithras-aligned kindred of England, who had learned of Ekaterina's interest in New York, seemed willing to cut their losses and began instead to shift their focus to other English colonies where their sect was more successful. Eventually, however, the Camarilla would come to reignite their attempts to lay claim to New York, and thus while the city would nominally be considered Camarilla, it would consistently be a smoldering hotbed of intersect conflicts. Ekaterina, who remained bishop for a long time, would find herself put under the administration of the recently appointed Archbishop Francisco Domingo de Polonia in 1761, and in a Pala Grande of the Sabbat in 1969, she was betrayed and presumed killed, although it would later turn out that she had survived the attack, barely, and remained in torpor for the next 30 or so years. The Ventru Michaela, sire of Helen Panhard, would swoop in during the late 20s, that is, the 1920s, during the market crash and would make billions further down the road as the stock market recovered. She would use this money that she made to try to further destabilize Sabat efforts and ensure Camarilla safety until she could attempt to claim princehood in 1980. Michaela's conceit drew the ire of the Sabbat who mobilized and worked hard to suppress her, and for many years New York laid firmly in the hands of the Sabbat with some notable exceptions, including the Chantry of the Five Boroughs, managed by Ashling Sturbridge. Eventually, in 1999, the city was taken by the Camarilla through a joint effort of many of the sect's hardest hitters, but Michaela would suffer final death at the hands of Polonia before the Archbishop fled the city. Calibros, the leader of the local Nosferatu Warren, found himself, against his better wishes, appointed Prince Pro Tempore of New York City in the wake of the Camarilla establishing a proper foothold. 
and while he held the title for a short while, he found himself chafing under its expectations and obligations and quietly stepped down from the throne once the embers of the war began to cool. The Camarilla, who had appointed him prince simply because it would provide ample distraction while they worked out who would replace him, rallied to see who would take up the crown next. There were several prominent kindred who would happily see themselves take that position, a few of which we should pay extra attention to. There was, of course, the harpy of the court and the child of Michaela, Helen Panhard. Panhard remained staunchly conservative, however, which rubbed many of the local anarchs wrong, as she firmly believed in a Tremere Torridor Ventru Entente with her at the helm. Likewise, while she did have much experience aiding her sire in her nightly affairs, the time of Michaela's princedom was one of a constant besieging by the Sabbat. With them out of the picture, more or less, it was questionable just how useful she would be in a prince position. Despite this, Panhard would come to argue for the opposite, presenting ideas that many considered novel and liberal coming from Aventru, and she urged for fostering relationships with the independent clans and rebuilding the city and its population and culture rather than enforcing restrictions. Supporting Panhard were Catherine Weisse, the owner of the art gallery The Art Hole, which would come to serve as a semi-permanent Elysium, as well as Helen's fellow harpy Thomas Arturo, although Arturo being an architect, he would certainly stand to profit from Helen's desire to rebuild the city. Challenging Helen were, among others, the Malkavian Carter van der Weyden, an heir of one of the original Dutch settlers and a skilled lawyer, Kadir al-Asmari, and perhaps surprisingly Boss Callahan, the leader of the local anarchs, who would then of course style himself by the title of Baron instead. Van der Weyden had a high chance of claiming the title of prince, as he was considered a fair and just ruler in cases, and also served as an ambassador of sorts in helping Sabbat Canaanites, uninterested in sacrificing themselves for their sect in retaining control over the city, to escape it unharmed. If Helen was considered conservative, however, van der Weyden would be even more so, as his vision would be of a strong, monodominant prince ruling with merely the council of the primogen serving in an advisory capacity. Kadir, meanwhile, had served faithfully as the sheriff of New York City for several years, and before that he worked briefly as an archon under Don Zero, the same Jessicar who employed Theo Bell. Bell urged Kadir to vie for the role of prince, and Kadir, who had felt his humanity eroding during his long stint as sheriff, considered it an option in order to preserve his humanitas, planning then to resign as sheriff if he could obtain that title. Unfortunately for Kadir, few kindred in New York actually liked him, and what respect he had earned was to his office and his brutal efficiency in executing his duties, not his social graces. Boss Callahan, the Ventru, although technically a Ventru unto Tribu, since his sire was Sabat, had bought himself the embrace after having helped embezzle millions of dollars out of New York City. Boss Callahan, as he began to style himself after his embrace, quickly grew disillusioned by the grotesque and uncivilized Sabat and realized that, being anti tribu, he would never be considered equal to the La Sombra, who were the political leaders of the sect. Thus, he would join up with another movement, the Anarchs, among which he had earned himself power and respect. This, after all, was what he desired, but when the Camarilla came in to lay claim to the Sabat territory, he and his Anarch allies, who had remained outside of the fighting, found themselves once again on the sideline. Thus, Callahan would aspire to, perhaps for a second time, side with another sect, although only if the money would turn out right. We know, of course, who would eventually come to become Prince of New York, Helen Panhard, who would rise to the top, supported by just enough people to pass the finish line first. She would promote van der Weyden to the primogen of his clan, and kept Arturo as a harpy and Kadir as sheriff. The events of Coteries of New York took place in 2019 and followed one of three potential fledglings who were embraced as part of an elaborate and ultimately pointless game imagined by Thomas Arturo who had grown bored with the current status quo. Employing his vast networks of contacts and boons, he roped a kindred who was merely traveling through the city to embrace the main character and then depart, setting in motion a chain of events that would eventually bring the death of a notable member of the Camarilla society. The fledgling, whom the player would take the role of, was found by Kadir, who had remained the sheriff of New York despite failing in his bid to become prince, and was then brought to Elysium at the Art Hall, where they were to be executed due to their embrace not being sanctioned by Prince Panhard. It is unclear why Kadir had chosen to remain the sheriff of New York City when he clearly felt that it was damaging his sense of morality and humanity, but perhaps he had come to terms with it under the new prince, or had merely accepted that he would eventually become a beast himself.
thanks to the intervention of Sophie Langley, a Torador socialite and one ambitious enough to want to make a bid for the position of prince, the fledgling was spared and put under Sophie's tutorship. She provided them with a haven, taught them the very basics of surviving the nightly affairs of the kindred, and finally gave them a list of four names. Four kindred who would potentially make good prospects for a coterie she urged the fledgling to form. These four were Agathon, a Tremere studying under Ashling Sturbridge and who needed help dealing with a fellow Tremere, Juno, who had seen through the pyramid's rigid structures and was trying to get out. Agathon was closed up and quiet, difficult to read, but had a soft heart that he tried desperately to hide from others. Hope was a Malkavian programmer and e-girl who filmed herself performing bloody livestreams where she mutilated herself before an adoring online audience. She was deeply resentful to Cara Montgomery, the CEO of Double Spiral, a company working to create thousands of fake identities for the Camarilla kindred to hide behind in order to fool the Second Inquisition, and Cara expecting these vampires of course to pay her vast amounts of money in return. The Angelo was a Nosferatu private investigator who had previously worked for Kadir in some capacity. He would style himself as a noir-type snoop who often monologued for himself as he was making his investigations out to be like a pulp novel. D'Angelo was investigating a series of messy murders where the victims were drained dry and signs were pointing to kindred involvement. And Tamika, finally, was a descendant from the almost legendary gangrel Jezebel, who helped the Camarilla greatly in bringing down the Sabbat of New York, yet was given no recognition for her work and thus had since left the city, and her childer, behind. It is even believed that she might have been killed by the Second Inquisition. Tamika wanted to protect her younger brothers and sisters of her clan, and the fledgling got dragged into her fight against the Second Inquisition in order to do so. Along the way, the fledgling would encounter several other influential kindred of New York, for example Kaiser, an informant brokering Nosferatu, practically living in his refurbished limousine where he would spy and listen in on more or less every secret going on in the Big Apple. There was Robert Larson, the primogen of the Thinbloods, who was constantly struggling to keep his head above the surface and fighting off the sharks of the Camarilla, who would love nothing more than to see him fail. Valerie, the scourge of New York, who derived a great pleasure in hunting down and destroying illegal Thinbloods and caitiffs. Adelaide Davis, an obsessive Malkavian, embraced in the mid-1800s, who would begin to stalk the fledgling until the two either entered a relationship, weird as it would be, or she was chased off by Sophie. And finally Benoit, Sophie's estranged childer, once a naughtiest scholar, but now trying to find solace in his faith, attempting to purify himself and the fledgling by exposure to a priest whose faith burned them by its very touch. Eventually Sophie required the fledgling to approach the anarchs of the city, specifically Torque, one of the barons, in order to establish a meeting between him and Sophie. By approaching one of Torque's trusted lieutenants, Mia, the fledgling managed to work their way into the group's midst, but was severely punished for this by Boss Callahan, who considered himself the Baron of New York City. Bruised and bloodied, the fledgling managed to secure a meeting between Torque and Sophie regardless, much to the anger of Mia, who felt undermined and played by the fledgling after they revealed their connection to the Camarilla. But before they could get to the meeting, the fledgling was found in their haven and staked by the Second Inquisition, who would spend the next two days experimenting upon them before moving to transport them to a safer location. But before they could do that, however, the fledgling would wake up in their coffin and would later be saved, either by their coterie mates or by goons of Kaiser in case they failed to befriend any of the four kindred. It would turn out that Kaiser had been keeping an eye on the fledgling and discovered the attack. With the Second Inquisition hot on the trail, the fledgling would then head off to meet with Torque and Sophie to begin to plan their eventual takeover of the city. It would seem that Sophie had information pertaining to Helen Panhard and Boss Callahan. In fact, she suspected that Helen had bloodbound the Anarch leader to herself. Yet before they could pursue the matter further, Torque's bar was attacked by the Second Inquisition and the three would barely escape, making their way to a temporary safe house before they decided to once again pursue their goals. They would depart for Ellis Island, where Panhard and Callahan were supposed to meet, and they would indeed come upon the two in a compromising position, Boss Callahan drinking straight out of Panhard's veins. A scuffle would ensue, but before it would come to a satisfying conclusion, Thomas Arturo would reveal himself, explaining that Sophie had been manipulated from the start by him in order to take on the fledgling. He also explained that there was no real reason for the entire charade, except that he wanted some kind of variation to the humdrum of the nightly activities, and then unceremoniously Sophie was killed by Adelaide Davis, who was seemingly working for Arturo. 
Torque managed to escape, and the fledgling was then faced with a decision, death or servitude to Arturo. Coteries of New York did not offer a satisfying ending in many regards. Personally, I considered the ending a bit rushed, and I'm sure many would agree with me, but having recently replayed it, it was not quite as jarring as the first time around. It is not very clear who Arturo is and what his motivations are, at least if you haven't read New York by Night, nor his connection to Adelaide Davis. The ending takes away much of the agency of the player, and also renders it moot if they were successful in gathering a coterie or not, since they played no part in the final scene. Yet these things also worked well to illustrate one of the biggest themes of Coteries of New York, that you are a pawn in someone else's game, and that you will never have full control of your actions or to prepare accordingly for what you are about to face. It is painfully clear that you survived only by the graces of your elders, and that Sophie serves as a very powerful lesson in the dangers of trying to play above your station. Despite then leaving a sour taste in your mouth, knowing what is to happen, I can strongly recommend replaying Coteries of New York because it does some things extremely well. The art, music, mood and writing is top notch, and the kindred of New York are multifaceted, interesting and disturbing in just the right way, and I believe that I will absolutely headcanon from now on that kindred have slightly glowing or reflective eyes now, because I absolutely love this little detail in the game. But on then to my review of Shadows of New York, and Keep in mind, this is very much spoiler territory because the game came out today, and you have been warned. Shadows of New York begins in 2019 and it follows the story of Julia, a young Polish expat who works as an investigative journalist in New York, writing for a magazine that she once adored, but has now grown increasingly jaded with. Julia is investing all of her time and energy into digging up dirt on the company Double Spiral, its shady CEO and her brother described as a sexual predator of the worst kind. Yet Julia has caught the eyes of the La Zambra, who only recently joined the Camarilla, and thus she sees all her work go to ruin as she is systematically pushed closer and closer to the edge in order to test the strength of her will. Anyone familiar with the La Zambra would know that this is a usual recruitment tactic. When she is deemed ready, she is given the embrace and is made the La Samba representative of New York City. But keep in mind, not the Primogen. Fast forward to 2020 and Julia is once again disillusioned with her current state. She is working as a glorified migrations officer for the Camarilla, keeping tabs on who enters and who leaves the city and reporting to her boss Kadir, who remains the sheriff of New York City. Yet the murder of a prominent figure amongst the city's kindred results in her being given the task of investigating it, and as she digs further into the circumstances of the victim's death and the events leading up to it, she comes to realize that this is her chance, perhaps her last chance, to make a difference in her life and turn her fate around. Right out the door, I'm incredibly impressed with the visuals and music of Shadows of New York. It remains true to the aesthetics of Coteries, but adds a dash of royal purple to it all, as well as implementing shadowy, barely visible figures fading in and out of existence. As a La Zombra, Julia has a deep connection to the Abyss, and she often perceives spirits and specters moving about, sometimes guiding, sometimes misleading her. The music relies heavily on string instruments and brings a somber, powerful set of songs to play, and it really suits the overwhelming, oppressive mood of the game. You're not playing a fledgling, but someone who's well aware of how disposable they are and what kind of monsters they are working for. The environment artwork is, like with Coteries, absolutely top-notch, and while a few assets are reused, that is more than acceptable with the additions of much, much more in this game. And just like in Coteries, the environments are also alive, with little things happening in the background adding to the immersion. While the previous game employed some still life artwork of certain scenes, this is far more common in Shadows of New York, and I really appreciate it. There is a conscious use of lighting, camera angles and silhouettes to really drag one into the rough and dirty life of a kindred at the bottom of the social ladder. The prelude of the story, in particular, evokes a very powerful scene which, through mainly as writing, is one of the best depictions of the embrace I have ever read. Julia is not a complete lone wolf in this game, as she has been allowed to remain with her human partner Dakota, who seems to be an expert in conspiracy theories. The two have a very interesting dynamics and I felt like her inclusion in the story provided a much needed sense of relief and escape from the oppressiveness of the rest of the game. It's a very stark contrast and I think the writing was especially good whenever Dakota and Julia interacted. Julia describes herself as a voyeur and it's not hard to tell why. 
She spends considerable time in a fast food restaurant, and many times you are given the option in the game to say or do nothing but watch. Even so, it is clear that Julie is powerful and knows about it too. You are often given prompts to employ your disciplines if you wish, and unlike coteries there is no hunger system to worry about. Feeding is still an option, but is more added as an optional path for the story to take, rather than a strict necessity. In Coteries of New York, there would every night be icons popping up representing story threads you could pursue, new ones cropping up after some time had passed, yet old ones remaining. Not so much in Shadows of New York, where you are often given three possible scenarios per night to choose from, able to only pursue two. I enjoyed this choice for multiple reasons, primarily because one of the weaknesses of the previous game was that it was difficult to know how much time you had left. Would it be worthwhile to pursue a side story, for example, if you still hadn't convinced your second Coterie member to join you? In Shadows, that will not be an issue, as the story is pushed forward regardless. It does remove some of the autonomy of the previous title, and Shadows in general is a bit more linear in its design than Coteries, but I really do not consider that an issue. The major story is altered somewhat by certain key decisions made by Julia, which will impact her behavior in other dialogues as well, and without giving too much away, it resembles in a sense the Paragon and Renegade system of Mass Effect, in that Julia can either pursue things by the book, or do whatever she needs to learn more about the case. Shadows of New York also offers much more insight into the Camarilla than Coteries of New York did. Several new characters are introduced, and quite a number make a reappearance, often with new artwork. There is also a much clearer effort of trying to be inclusive in this game as well, which I overall think was done really well, although I am still a little unsure about one character who shows up very briefly. Catherine Weisse, the owner of the art hall, shows up in this game as well, and while I certainly don't want to give away too much of the story, she plays a relatively important role in Julia's development, although to be honest I think she was a little underutilized, as she could certainly serve as a powerful inspiration for the journalist turned detective. Benoit from the previous game shows up once more in Shadows, but honestly it felt like a completely different character. Being a Toreador, I could sort of see where this change in behavior might have come from, but I do think that his relationship with, and the way he acts around Julia, is a jarring difference from how he was portrayed in Coteries. Like I said, it really does feel like two different characters. One thing that stuck out to me a lot while playing was the decision to include references to COVID-19, and while I appreciate and understand the reasoning behind it, being that it would bring an added sense of realism to the story considering it does take place primarily in 2020, I personally feel like they could have just as well not to. It doesn't necessarily add anything to the story, in my opinion, and I myself prefer to avoid any real life issues going on right now in my games. That being said, this is definitely a matter of personal opinion as I've seen a fair share of online discussions on how to include it in other chronicles. The pacing of Shadows of New York is really good, and there definitely is a lesson learned by the authors from the previous game. You're given a very strict deadline to solve the case, and there are many callbacks to the previous game in the story, and I often found myself lost in how events from Coteries were talked about by the other kindred of New York. It's really well done how it is presented as a series of nebulous and vague events, seeing as how very few would know the full story. Shadows of New York, like I mentioned, leans a little more heavily in the other direction of Coteries in terms of you being led by your nose. I feel like there was a much smaller risk of failure in this game than the previous one, and most of the side stories play a significantly smaller role in this game than in the last. At the time of this review, I've played through the game twice, and I personally think I've seen most of what the game has to offer in terms of a story. That being said, overall I still appreciate this approach more than how Coteries was structured, Again, mostly because Cody's structure was vague and a little misleading the first time around. And in terms of a player character, I absolutely love Julia. She's a perfect La Sombra, and I connected with her immediately. There's a lot of work put into showing off her personality, her way of thinking and behaving, and she's incredibly well written. The way she interacts with the kindred and kind of New York City is really well done, and I believe that it was a great decision to abandon the choice between many characters in favor of just one, more fleshed out at that. Finally, I think that the good people of Draw Distance heard everyone's complaints about the Coterie's ending loud and clear, because the ending of this game, of which there are two, are both quite satisfying and very, very different. So would I recommend this game? Absolutely. First of all, both this game and Coteries of New York stand very strongly as independent titles for people who might be new to Vampire the Masquerade. 
I haven't mentioned it yet, but the encyclopedia in the game that updates with terminology and phrases you hear while playing is extremely nicely written. On that merit alone, these two games are worth investing in, for newer players especially, as it will give you a lot of insight into the workings of the Camarilla, and for veterans it will give you a refresher on the Lasombra's role in their new sect, not to mention some insight into role-playing vampire in the 2020s. As for being games, I first need to emphasize that these are visual novels. If you don't like reading, or in fact are unable to read for whatever reason, this game might not be for you, unfortunately. There is a lot of text to go through, and there are, as far as I know, no accessibility options for those visually impaired, or who have some manner of reading difficulties. Likewise, if you're expecting a lot of interaction or influence over the story, you may have to temper your expectations. While you have some influence over how Julia reacts to events and speak to others, the game is generally not very flexible and will quickly reroute you in on the appropriate path that it's telling you to go. This is of course not uncommon for visual novels, and within that category, this game stands out as a very well-produced example. If you're interested in well-written stories set in World of Darkness, I would say this is a must-buy. Likewise, the game's illustrations and soundtrack are amazing, and definitely worth the price by themselves. It's crammed full of inspiring vampires that provide a plethora of inspiration for players and storytellers alike, so at worst, it's some pretty damn good reference material as well. Was the story predictable? Yes and no. I had my suspicions of what was going to happen in the end, and one of my theories proved correct. But, as with many titles like this, the journey was as much if not even more interesting than the ending. And it was a damn good ending at that. Bittersweet indeed, and a very good addition to the growing library of games set in the world of darkness. Whew. So, there you have it. Now, I only have one question for you folks. Would you like to see me stream this game? I was battling with the decision on whether I should or not, but ultimately I decided not to reveal too much of the plot in this video on the off chance that you all wanted to watch me play through it, possibly discussing lore and trivia while doing so. So are you excited to play Shadows of New York? Do you want to watch and or listen to me play it? Let me know in the comments below. Until next time, stay safe out there, for the time of Thin Bloods is surely upon us.